Hi, I'm Anna Hoffman, and welcome to this episode of Data Exposed Live. I'm super excited to have you all joining me today from wherever you are for our first stream of 2022. Super excited to be back. I uh, hope everyone had a nice break if you got to take a break, uh, but we're back and ready to get right back into updates on Azure SQL. And this year, we're going to be introducing some new updates as well. We're going to try to start tying in some updates for other database services, things like Azure Cosmos DB or open source databases like Postgres or MySQL or MariaDB. Um, so with that, let's just get right into the show. Uh, by the way, we'll be doing Data Exposed Live news updates uh, the first Wednesday of every month at 9 a.m. Pacific, so mark your calendars. Uh, sometimes it ends up being the second Wednesday, but for the most part, we're shooting for the first Wednesday of every month. And we're going to be covering the news. You can see we have lots of special guests on today. And this is our January news update. But keep in mind, we're going to be giving you all the updates essentially since Microsoft Ignite, which was at the beginning of November. And throughout the episode, you'll learn some of the reasons as to why. All right, now, if you have questions, we would love to take your questions from wherever you're streaming in from, whether it's Twitch, Twitter, YouTube, Learn TV, or you're coming in through an event from the Microsoft Reactor. We are looking at all the questions that are coming in, and we can even post them as they come in and ask them live or at, answer them on the chat. So please go ahead and ask your questions, um, and let's get right into product updates. Uh, all right, so the way we're going to do this is we're going to talk about some Azure SQL Managed Instance updates in preview and general availability. So from the general availability side for Azure SQL Managed Instance, uh, in the past two months, we've announced things like distributed transactions across multiple managed instances and long-term retention. Uh, Long-term retention is a big one because it's something that's been available in Azure SQL Database for some time. And the idea here is that you can keep backups stored for up to 10 years. And this is a big ask from some of our customers. Uh, for Azure SQL Database, one of the things we recently added is the ability for you to uh, change your backup storage redundancy options. So for example, uh, by default, it used to be globally re geo redundant storage, but now you have the option of selecting locally redundant storage or zone redundant storage. And another thing that became available was outbound firewall rules to storage accounts. And again, we're going to have links in our blog so you can learn all about these things um, if you want to learn more. And in public preview, we had a couple things land for Azure SQL database hyperscale. Uh, one of those is going to be maintenance windows. Now, this is something that came available for some of our other services earlier in the year in preview. And this is essentially the ability to select when any maintenance to your databases might occur. So you can select, for example, weeknights or weekend nights or other kind of time windows like that. And so this is now available in public preview for Azure SQL Database Hyperscale as well. Um, and we also announced auto failover groups for Azure SQL Database Hyperscale. We have a very special guest today later in the show. We're going to talk about this in detail. And finally, in public preview, we announced Azure SQL bindings for Azure Functions. So for all you developers out there or all you data professionals that are using Azure Functions, it just got that much easier to integrate them with Azure SQL with these new bindings. And we will have an episode on Data Exposed soon on this topic. So you'll want to stay tuned and make sure you follow our show. Best Data Exposed live here. We got a comment from uh, one of our regular viewers. Um, so glad, glad you feel that way. And thanks for joining us. Okay, so I mentioned this year we're going to also start covering some other database updates. So we're going to see how this goes. Uh, would love to hear from you all if this is something you want to see more of, something you want to see less of, something you want more details into. But at this point, we're just going to give you the highlight reel of some of the things that were announced across some of our other database services like Cosmos DB announced a new uh, Python SDK, some new support options there, as well as some uh, support for Glow Root. Uh, some other updates among our open source databases. The biggest, I would say, for me landed in the beginning of November and end of November for 
Postgres and MySQL, we announced the general availability of Flexible Server. Uh, a lot of great things come with Flexible Server. We're seeing a lot of customers move from single server to Flexible Server uh, for the benefits that come around manageability and other items related to that. So definitely check that out. And you can see there's other other items here, things like long-term retention for single server. You can see a lot of the things that we'll talk about for Azure SQL apply in some form or fashion across our other databases as well. All right, so we've talked a lot about some of the updates, but there was one update that came, I believe it landed during Ignite. And actually there were a lot of updates for Azure SQL Manage Instance that did land during Microsoft Ignite. Um, so I'll share a reference if you wanna catch up on all those awesome updates. But one of those updates was service endpoint policies for Azure SQL Managed Instance. Now, this is something I gotta be honest, I don't know a ton about, so I thought it would be awesome uh, to bring on Zoran uh, to tell Hi. us a little about it. Hi, Zoran, thanks for joining us on the show. Thanks for having me here. Of course, always a pleasure. And uh, before we get into these endpoint policies, I'd love if you could just tell us a little bit about what you do. Sure. Well, I'm a senior program manager with the Azure SQL Managed Instance Program Group, and my area of purview is networking and connectivity. And what that means is that um, I ensure that uh, Azure SQL Managed Instance seamlessly integrates with the customer's networking ar network architecture, both on-prem and in the cloud, that it offers connectivity scenarios in broad, in a, uh, it actually offers connectivity capabilities in a broad range of end-to-end -end scenarios, and also that it delivers on the platform as a service promise for database administrators by making it easy to deploy, configure, and manage. So that's essentially networking connect and connectivity. And these service endpoint policies that you mentioned, Anna, are actually a part of the uh, networking aspect as they are originally implemented in the uh, Azure networking stack. So what we've done here is we've brought this feature into Azure SQL Managed Instance that has hitherto been disabled. Uh, I want to state that this is this feature is currently in public preview, and we're looking to bringing it into general availability later this year. So awesome. um, yeah. this is this is exciting, and it seems like you're the perfect person to be talking to us about endpoint policy. So thanks for coming on the show. Um, I do want to maybe take us back. Like, can you take us through like the scenarios? Like, what are endpoint policies, and why are they relevant for SQL managed instance? Absolutely. Actually, I do have a slide deck that talks awesome. right about that. So let's let's take a look. All right. So uh, the broader scenario that we'll be covering here is how to harden your Azure SQL managed instance against data exfiltration. That is what this is what service endpoint policies really are all about. But let's take a step back and talk a little bit about uh, how to get that going. So for simplicity's sake, we'll consider a trivial example to illustrate the problem we'll be solving. Now, in the cloud, it is common to use storage accounts as intermediary data destinations when we orchestrate workloads that span multiple components or services. So suppose, for example, that we have a busy SQL instance in production, and we want to perform some fairly heavy analysis over its production data, but we don't want the instance to suffer a performance hit. We can create a new Azure SQL managed instance for analysis and add one auxiliary storage account, then perform a backup of our production instance over there and finally restore this backup to the analysis SQL instance. Now we can query this new instance and not worry about affecting our production server. There are of course other ways to do the same, but this is a good illustration of an intermediary storage account in action. There are other scenarios in which this auxiliary storage account pattern appears, and they include database migration service and log replay service to migrate on-premise databases to the cloud, replicating data with transactional application, logging, auditing, or extended events to a file in the cloud, T-SQL commands such as bulk insert and open row set bulk, and more. Now, going back to our backup and restore example that we're going to use as a straw man, we want to make sure that the flow of data is secured as the data passes from production instance to storage to analysis instance. Apart from the physical encryption and authentication aspects of security, we also need to have authorization controls in place that determine where our data is allowed to go. If we get this right, we'll have better defense against data exfiltration that includes misconfigured automations, malicious actors, and human error. As it stands, it is entirely possible for our backup and restore operations to target an unsafe storage account. For example, suppose we write a PowerShell script that creates an analysis instance and does backup and restore by way of an intermediary storage account. 
Um, we develop this script in our development and testing subscription. We run it and we say, okay, this works well. But then we forget to change the storage account when we run the script in our production subscription. Uh, this submission may leak production data mm. into our dev and test subscription, yet we wouldn't even know it because everything would just work in production. So how do we make sure that our backup and restore operations only ever target our green approved Azure storage account? So recall that Azure SQL Managed Instance deploys in a subnet inside your Azure Virtual Network. Meanwhile, all storage accounts belong to the Azure Storage Service. Our managed instances will connect to Azure Storage to backup and restore data by following the traffic routing rules as specified in that subnet's routing table. Now, Azure Virtual Network offers a security mechanism to filter and control the traffic outbound to specific Azure services. This mechanism is called service endpoints. Setting up a service endpoint on a subnet will route all traffic going to an Azure service. Here, we're talking about Azure Storage, but there are others as well through the Azure Backbone Network. So in effect, doing this ensures that the traffic to our storage account will enjoy the best in performance and physical security across regions, regardless of routes we may have configured in our subnet's routing table. Now that we have a service endpoint governing our traffic to Azure Storage, we can do some traffic control. There's a type of Azure resource called service endpoint policy. Service endpoint policies specify what our subnet is allowed to contact. Here, if we attach a service endpoint policy to our subnet and configure this policy to allow only our backup storage account, then all other Azure storage accounts, regardless of their region, will become unreachable from within our subnet. Even if our Azure SQL managed instance is misconfigured and attempts to backup to or restore from unsafe storage, this connection attempt will be rejected outright. So in brief, we just saw how to configure our Azure SQL managed instances so that they can only read from and write to pre-approved Azure storage accounts. Now, there are a couple of gotchas we need to keep in mind before we wrap it up. Service endpoint policies will implicitly deny connections to all storage accounts not in scope of their definitions. And this is very important. This effectively flips your subnet behavior once you configure service endpoint policies. Your subnet will stop behaving as allow all connections to, and we'll start behaving as deny all connections to Azure Storage except the ones that I've explicitly permitted. So when you begin writing policies and when you begin assigning service endpoint policies to your subnets, be mindful of this, prepare your storage account inventory ahead of time, and scope broadly to narrow down later. You can write policy definitions to allow storage accounts either individually or include all storage accounts that belong to a particular resource group or even include all storage accounts that belong to a particular subscription, whatever makes sense for your cloud architecture. You can also have multiple service endpoint policies assigned to a subnet, and each may consist of multiple policy definitions, mix and match as it works. And still, this is a key point, and this explains why we hadn't allowed this service endpoint policies previously managed instance. No matter how you configure service endpoint policies on an Azure SQL managed instance subnet, you won't disrupt the regular operation of the Azure SQL Managed Instance itself. The Azure SQL Managed Instance will ensure that its built-in storage accounts remain accessible regardless of the presence or absence of any particular service endpoint policies on that subnet. And lastly, do keep in mind that resource locks and Azure policy deny effects may stop Azure SQL Managed Instance from updating the subnet to ensure its traffic is unimpeded as the configuration changes. If this is the case, then Azure SQL Managed Instance will prevent the assignment of any service endpoint policies, and you will get an error by which you can backtrack and repair. Read more about this, how to set up and use service endpoint policies to harden your Azure SQL Managed Instance on the link displayed below. Awesome. That about sums Thank it up. Yeah, this is really awesome, Zoran, and I love the way you took us through a scenario. I actually learned a lot about this. It kind of reminds me of this overall um, overall principles that we have around, you know, the principles of least privilege. So instead of allowing all, we're denying all and only allowing uh, what needs to be allowed. So this is really great info. Um, I think our viewers will find it useful. Uh, viewers, go ahead and check out that link. And we'll also put a link to it in our blog, which should have gone live by now. So you can also check that out. Again, uh, Zoran, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me and have a great day. Thanks.
Awesome. Cool. I always love this show because I get to learn so much uh, from folks like Zoran and other people on our team. All right. Changing gears a little bit. I want to tell you about all the blogs and videos that have happened uh, in the past since Ignite. So warning, there's a lot. Uh, so from a data exposed perspective, and remember with data exposed, we release new episodes every Thursday. These are meant to be short episodes with members of our product group or uh, organization, as well as on once a month on Tuesdays, we end, release MVP episodes with members of the community. Uh, you can see we've been hard at work implementing a lot of stuff here, uh, putting out a lot of videos around Azure Arc enabled data services. So if you want to learn about the new GA of directly connected mode and how it works, Lior did a great video. Hamish Watson, uh, one of our MVPs, did an episode on KQL, which is getting a ton of hits. Uh, people are really interested in KQL and how to use it and how to learn it. Um, we did some videos continuing our Azure SQL VM series. You might want to check those out. We started a SQL Server 2022 series, which has been pretty exciting. Uh, we've had Bob Ward on as well as Pedro Lope. So those are some good ones to check out. Uh, Rob Sewell from the community came on to tell us about Azure Arc enabled data services SQL managed instance. Uh, also taught me a new uh, UK word called NOT, which means nothing. Um, and we had some episodes about Azure Synapse Data Explorer, data loading in Azure SQL database. You can see there's just a ton here uh, for you to learn about different things, regardless of what it is in the Azure data and database space. Uh, to follow along with all these or catch up or see anything related to them, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel in the top right corner of your screen. All right, so those are videos. Moving on to blogs. So for those of you that might be joining us for the first time, we every month go through all the different blog, uh, blogs and then are able to kind of summarize them and give you some pointers on to what you might want to go read more into. So for the Azure blog, there were a couple that I found interesting. Uh, one is that we released two new data centers in Wyoming. So that's something to check out uh, just to show how much uh, we're expanding as far as the Azure platform goes. Um, and then we also were featured in a study by Forrester. Now you guys might know that I, I mentioned Forrester every now and then because these are kind of industry wide uh, studies that they do, not done by Microsoft or these other companies that you might see here, uh, to see where people lie in certain industries. So I thought this iPaaS was interesting. You might be wondering, what is iPaaS? Uh, this is integration platform as a service. So uh, this is a little tangential to Azure databases that we usually talk about. But I think it's important to note that Microsoft is a leader in this space. So in this space of Azure Logic Apps, Azure Event Hubs, Azure Service Bus, uh, Power Automation, and a lot of the things that the Power Platform has to offer in this space, uh, from an integration side, we are recognized as a leader. So when you go to select a database that you want to invest in and which cloud you want to put it on, uh, knowing how the other services uh, kind of stack up is important. So I wanted to feature that here. Uh, now, there was also another Forrester Wave study released in December. This one is more directly related to us, and that is the magic quadrant for cloud database management system platforms, or DBMS. Uh, now, Rohan, our CVP of Azure Data, released this blog announcing the results from uh, Gartner, sorry, not Forrester, from Gartner. And what you can see is up there in the top right. Uh, so ideally, if you haven't seen this magic quadrant, the top right is where you want to be, because that means you are uh, not only have completeness of vision, but you also have ability to execute. So this is pretty exciting for us. We're excited to be up there in the top. A uh, couple other blogs you might consider checking out for Azure cost management and billing. If you're on that side of the house in your organization, uh, every month they release updates here, kind of like we do. Uh, but they did a year in review and talked about all the updates. So if you're not following this closely, uh, then this one blog might be something worth checking out. And then I included the blog that Asad Khan, our uh, program manager lead, kind of our director of program management here in Azure databases uh, released the week after Ignite, where you can get all the updates from Ignite. Because remember, right now we're kind of talking about things post Ignite, but if you want to see things that were announced at Ignite, uh, that's a good place to go. 
So moving on to the SQL Server Tech Community blog, we have several Tech Community blogs we're going to talk through today, and there are quite a few updates, so please bear with me. Uh, so a couple ones I wanted to call out. I won't go through every single one. Uh, the first is the early technical preview of JDBC 10.1.0. Uh, there is a major breaking change in this preview over previous releases, uh, similar to how we had this HTTP to HTTPS default changes made in web browsers a few years ago, we're now changing the default value of this encrypt connection option from false to true. Now, this is something you're going to want to make sure uh, you know you fix uh, from a backwards compatibility stance. But we think this is the right time to make that force encryption to true. Um, so definitely something to consider when you move towards this. Update, yes, a more secure SQL Server. That's what we're going for. Uh, the next thing I wanted to mention was the new SCOM management packs for SQL Server, RS, AS, and Azure SQL Managed Instance. Uh, just to show you, where do I have it? Here. Uh, something new that they've also done is they're moving over to the uh, the docs pages, which I think is actually good for everyone because now we can access everything from one place. Uh, so, for example, if you want to learn more about any of these things, and we're doing the same thing for management packs, uh, you can just click here, and now we have this what's new, and you'll see every time they release an update, uh, kind of what's new in that update. So something to keep in mind and keep on your radar in the future. Let me hop back here. All right, uh, and then just wanted to call this out. I'm sure many of you heard about the uh, Log4j remote code execution vulnerability. Uh, if you want the official guidance from Microsoft, you can get to that from our SQL Server blog or our Azure SQL Tech Community blog. The next update is around new features for the SQL IaaS agent extension. So if you're using SQL Server and Azure Virtual Machine, uh, this is going to be something you might be interested in checking out. Uh, there are a couple things that are included in this new update. Uh, so we have upgraded the SQL IaaS agent extension to allow you to go from lightweight to full mode without a restart. So this is a big deal uh, if you are just trying to take advantage of the SQL IaaS extension without using a marketplace image. On the topic of marketplace images, we also released new Azure marketplace images. So these are refreshed. They have some new, uh, new things like uh, storage configuration and the ability to configure TempDB, among other things. And the final update in this space is the ability to choose a specific container in a storage account for your backups, as well as increasing the retention of those backups from 30 days to 90 days. So a lot going on there. If you want more details, we'll share it in the blog. Uh, there are some hot fixes released that fix a few things you might want to check out. Uh, there is a new uh, Django backend for Django v1.1. So, sorry, it's called <laughs> sorry SQL Server third party backend for Django. 1.1. And what this adds is support for Django 4.0. And the plan with this is every time there's a new version of Django or a new version of SQL Server, we'll go ahead and update this uh, backend. Uh, same thing for PHP. So you'll see we announced a new uh, driver in beta, which supports PHP 8.1 as well as Ubuntu 21.10. So lots of updates happening in this space. And similarly for the, uh, the, the Microsoft Data SQL client for .NET Data Provider. So if you're using that, we released version 4.0. And this is going to include, again, if you remember uh, the new update, which is going to use encrypt true by default, this version is going to have that as well. So something to keep in mind. And there's actually a lot of other updates in this 4.0 update. So you might want to check that out. From the SQL Server blog, there hasn't really been anything since Ignite. But if somehow you've been under a rock and you missed the announcement of SQL Server 2022, uh, you might want to check out this blog. So I did include a reference to this, which also will link you off to a bunch of other things we're doing in the SQL Server 2022 space. For the Azure SQL Tech Community blog, I promise we're going to get through this. There's a lot. But 
they're really exciting. So I wanted to share a couple of things with you. One, Nico from the SQL Management System is always doing these how-to blogs. And this one, this first one, how to find out the addressable disk space and files needed uh, is really interesting because it's going to go through and break down some of the complexities related to reserved and available disk space and how it affects you and how you can maximize the, the performance and the kind of the files that you're using. So you want to check that out. Uh, another two updates here I wanted to touch on on security. One is Azure Key Vault managed HSM support for TDE BYOK is now available. Uh, for those of you that might be uh, less skilled in the security space like myself, I had to look this up. And a managed HSM is a secu hardware security module. And this is a fully managed, highly available, single-titted, standards-compliant cloud service that allows you to custom uh, sorry, to safeguard your cryptographic keys for a cloud application. And this uses uh, FIPS 140-2, which is a very specific standard for doing this. Um, and this is built on Azure's confidential computing platform. So that's kind of manage HSMs. They're going to provide benefits like centralized key management, isolated access control, so local RBAC, uh, private endpoints, data residency, a lot's happening here. Uh, the thing to keep in mind is now to the ability to use these managed HSM with Azure SQL for TDE uh, for transparent data encryption is now generally available. So this is a big deal. You're going to be able to use managed HSMs for storing your encryption keys to protect your most confidential workloads in Azure SQL. So this is a big deal, something to check out. And again, similarly along that line, uh, user assigned managed identity support is now available for TDE, for BYOK, uh, for Azure SQL, and this is in preview. And essentially managed identities, just the, the briefest of <laughs> overviews, uh, managed identities in Azure Active Directly provide you the ability to uh, kind of authenticate Azure services automatically uh, without having to store those credentials um, in the application. So uh, this allows you to prevent having credentials in the code itself. All right, moving right along, two other things I wanted to touch on. One is the Azure SQL migration extension update. So every month they're updating a lot this Azure SQL migration extension in Azure Data Studio. So this is the ability to migrate to Azure SQL Managed Instance or SQL Server on Azure Virtual Machine uh, using Azure Data Studio. Some of the big updates here were portal updates to help with choosing which type of DMS you should use, uh, the support of migrating multiple databases simultaneously, this was a big ask, is now available. And you can track the progress of a migration in both Azure Data Studio as well as the Azure portal, which is something that was asked for. And the final thing uh, in this blog space that I wanted to highlight was introducing the new speaker library initiative. Uh, so this was done by our community lead, uh, Remerit, and she uh, was basically commenting on how, you know, how can we increase the diversity of speakers that we have? And so we're introducing some new support here for New Stars of Data, which is a conference for new speakers, as well as a mentoring program if you're interested in starting to speak in the SQL community. So I thought that was a cool one to highlight as well. Definitely something to check out. I know there's a ton of blogs, uh, but hopefully you feel like you're getting the overview. All right. So now we're going to take a break from me rambling on. Um, although hopefully it's not too bad. Uh, we're going to take a break from that and we're going to talk about something new and that is hyperscale auto failover groups uh, in Azure SQL database, the public preview of that. And for that, I'm going to bring on Emily. Emily, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me, Anna. Yeah, of course. Always a pleasure. And uh, Emily's been on the show a couple times, but one of the things, one of the many things that Emily owns is auto failover groups in hyperscale. And so I'd love, Emily, if you could tell us a little bit about this public preview and what it means. Yeah. So this public preview is something that we recently announced um, for auto failover groups for hyperscale. And what this really does is this expands your geo replication capabilities and your disaster recovery capabilities for your hyperscale databases. So using this, um, it allows for recovery during the loss of an entire Azure region, which can be done using automatic failover policies, planned failover, or forced failover. And 
So using an auto failover group can simplify your management experience of a group of one or more geo-replicated databases, allowing for a, um, them to be used as a unit for things like geo-replication and failover. And so using auto failover groups, you um, can also simplify your connectivity experience because we have something called a read-write listener endpoint, which will connect to your current primary server. And so by doing this, you can send read-write queries to your primary, which will transparently reconnect after failover. So you'll still be able to connect to your new primary for these read-write queries, even after failover. And similarly, there is also a read-only listener endpoint that'll connect to your current secondary. So you can use your geo-secondaries in other regions to um, use read-only workloads. And this listener endpoint will reconnect to your new secondary after failover as well. And so now let's take a look at what this will look like in Portal. So what you see here, which I'll explain what's happening on the left side of the screen in a bit, but let's first look at what this, the configuration looks like in Portal. This is the primary server that we're going to use for our auto failover group. And what you'll see is that this is in East US. And looking at the databases in this server, um, we have two databases that are both of the hyperscale tier. Now, looking at the failover group that I've configured um, with this server being the primary server in the failover group, what you'll see is we have our primary in East US, and then it's connected to a secondary server, which is in West US 3. And scrolling down, you see information about that read-write listener endpoint, which connects to our primary, and our read-only listener endpoint, which connects to our secondary. Now, looking more at the databases within the group, those two databases that we talked about earlier that are in the primary server, you see them both here. They're both part of the auto failover group, so they'll behave as a unit for geo-replication and failover. Now, um, looking at what is happening on the left side of the screen, what you're seeing is that I have this application running where we are running a T-SQL query that is inserting rows to our primary server on this AdventureWorks hyperscale database. Um, so we're just inserting new rows there. And whenever that successfully happens, you see this insert on primary successful. And then after that happens, we are trying to do a read on that row on this secondary server on the secondary AdventureWorks hyperscale database. So every time it succeeds, you'll see this message saying that this was successful. So now we're going to see what happens when we do a failover on this auto failover group. So we'll do this failover. And what's happening in this failover is we're switching roles between the primary and the secondary. So the West US 3 secondary server will become the primary and the um, East US um, initial primary server will become the secondary. So while this failover is happening, what you'll see is that these this read this write operation and this read operation that was previously succeeding will fail for a short period of time as the failover is taking place. Um, but soon after the failover completes, it'll be successful and it'll properly route the insert queries to our new primary, which will be the West US3 server. And then the reads will successfully happen on the previous um, primary, now secondary, which is the East US server. So we're already seeing that the inserts on the primary are succeeding again um, because the failover has completed. And you'll soon see that the reads on the secondary will start to succeed as well. Um, and and Emily, wh while it's happening, I was just wondering, like during this process uh, with a failover group, is the idea like, do I have to change some connection strings or what, what's the process? Like how, how did you get this to start succeeding again without changing any connection strings? Yeah, good question, Anna. Um, so that the connection, if you use these, um, the read write listener endpoint and the read only listener endpoint, that handles the connection for you transparently. So if you are using the read write um, listener endpoint, that'll connect to your primary for you. So even after failover, you'll be able to connect to the new primary and have um, read writes connect um, there even after failover. You don't have that. All happens transparent. Um, you don't have to change your connection logic. So that's why we're seeing even after the failover, now that we're connecting to an entirely new region, we're still able to succeed in our um, inserts and our reads. Awesome, that's really cool. 
Great. And yeah, as you see now, both the inserts and the reads are successful. The um, previous secondary is now the primary. Um, the previous primary is now the secondary. Um, so what you saw here, it, and also you see that not only did the Adventure Works database that we were looking at um, fail over successfully, but this other database that was in our server failed over with it as well. So what you saw here is that um, auto failover groups allow for you to handle um, geo-replication of a unit of databases, and um, it happens transparently through read-write and read-only listener endpoints. Awesome. Cool. Well, thanks so much, Emily. Is there anything folks need to know to get started with this, or can they just start using it right away? Um, yeah, so you can. this is in public preview, so you can start using this right away. Um, there's a blog post that we have out about this um, that can help walk you through testing failover and configuring this auto failover group, um, including your hyperscale databases. So there's more information there to help you get started. Awesome. Cool. Well, thanks so much, Emily. This is pretty exciting stuff. And, uh, you know, as someone who's kind of played with this stuff before, I think it's it's a big thing for it to be added for hyperscale. Um, so it's awesome to see. And hopefully we'll have you on the show soon again to talk about the GA whenever that comes. <laughs> Great. Thanks, Anna. Thanks. Awesome. Cool. Very cool. So we've seen some cool stuff so far on the show. We have a couple more cool things and updates to share with you. Uh, I want to switch gears a bit and talk about the Azure database support blogs. Now, uh, just for those of you that, that might be new to this space or new to these blogs, uh, the Azure database support team is a, a great, very technical team of folks that help our customers with some of their most complex cases or issues that they run into. Um, so it's always interesting to keep tabs on the learnings that come here and when you have issues to also check in in this space. Uh, so definitely keep that in mind. And let's go through just a couple of examples here that have been released in the blog. I got two pages of blogs. The Azure Database Support team has been busy over the past couple months. Uh, just to highlight a few, so there's a blog on SQL injection, which gives a great refresher on SQL injection for those of you that might be new to this. Um, otherwise, even if you're not new, this uh, blog also walks through how advanced threat protection can help you in getting alerts when SQL injections occur. So that's good learning for everyone all around. Uh, the next one I found pretty interesting was uh, about the support team has a decent number of cases where a customer can't move from a provision database to a serverless database, and they're trying to understand why. So sometimes this will fail because there are certain features that support auto scaling in serverless, so auto scaling up and down, uh, but don't support auto pausing. And these things make sense, things like geo replication, long term backup retention, uh, a couple things related to elastic jobs, DNS aliases. So this was an interesting read uh, for those of you considering switching from provision to serverless. A um, couple of interesting other ones here, great tips around um, uh, doesn't match the server name on SQL Server SSL. Uh, so if you're connecting to Azure SQL or SQL Server from, the, uh, from Power BI, for example, and you're using a custom domain name, uh, the recommendation here from the team is to actually use the fully qualified domain name, so including the .database.windows.net. Uh, and the reason is that so that you can encrypt the traffic and validate the server certificate. Um, however, if this is not the route you want to go, they also do provide some workarounds, so it's always interesting to see that. Uh, a couple other things on this one. One was, where is my server storage taken? Uh, this is you know, something that I think uh, a lot of folks find confusing at first for Azure SQL, for Postgres, for MySQL. So this blog, and there's one more on the next page for MySQL, walks through like, what does it mean? Like how much storage is being used and where is it being used and how can I figure out uh, what's going on in this space? So uh, they do a really great job of breaking that down. The final one here is JSON. So Azure SQL does support the idea of loading JSON uh, into Azure SQL and we do a lot of great capabilities there to make it easier to process and handle. Uh, however, in this case, uh, all of the JSON documents were zipped. Uh, so how do you bring a bunch of zip JSON documents into Azure SQL? Um, this blog walks through some custom code you can actually just take uh, if this is a scenario that relates to you. So again, one of the great things that comes from 
uh, from the Azure Database Support Team. A couple other updates here. We'll keep them brief. Uh, some around command execution and error handling. Again, there's some custom code in here and some advice if that's something you're you're facing. And you know, just general best practices around retry logic, since that's such a big deal when you move to the cloud, uh, you can find there. Uh, the other one that I found interesting was this one, the imported database is smaller than original database. Uh, so this basically explains why sometimes if you import a database using a backpack into Azure SQL database, the file is smaller than the original you know, database that you thought you had. And the, the reason they go through this is the differences between how a backpack pack stores your data and how a full .bak file or back file is going to store your data and how that differs in size when you import because we're just storing the metadata and the data as opposed to the data on the pages that it's actually located in. Uh, so that's another interesting one. There are quite a few others there. So uh, lots of great stuff happening in this space. I always like to highlight it. Uh, now we have a couple more segments. And I'm super excited about this one. It's actually been a while uh, since Cheryl's been on the show, but we're going to have our SQL in a Minute segment. And today we're going to be having Cheryl and William come on and talk to us about some things that are new. So without further ado, let me bring on Cheryl and William, and I'll pass it over to you guys. Thanks so much for coming on the show. Thank you. And I've missed everyone that's been here. Um, I want to thank everyone for joining me today on SQL in a Minute, when we have this opportunity to talk about SQL and some of the related areas. Today, I'm joined by William from the SQL Docs team. Wim, welcome to the show. Um, tell me a little Thanks, bit Cheryl. how you got started in this space. <clears throat> well, going all the way back, um, I was a developer, .NET, .NET 1.1 era, and they kept saying, William, why don't you go work on this uh, this trigger instead. Why don't you go work in the stored procedure instead? So I, I took the hint and I went into the database area and then the recession happened and I went into consulting and uh, data platform MVP. And 14 years later, I'm, I'm here at Microsoft and I'm being able to contribute to the product that was foundational to my career and a lot of other people's careers in the data community. Wow, that sounds like an exciting path. And I'm so, um, I know you and I spent some time working together. And so I'm really interested in finding out what can you share today about what's happening within SQL? So yeah, well, first off, we're very excited about uh, the next version of SQL Server, codenamed Dallas. It's really exciting. We've got a lot of things in progress. I can't talk too much about some of those things, but I know there's a lot of things to be excited about. Uh, check this space for a lot more news on that, I'm sure. So Azure Arc enabled services. And so Azure Arc is a really exciting thing. If you haven't heard a lot about it, there's a lot more coming on that as well. There's some new quick starts if you're interested, including an introduction on how to host Azure Arc enabled SQL managed instances on-prem with Active Directory authentication. So that's pretty cool. And then also officially we announced and documented last month, just before the holidays, Windows 11 support for SQL Server 2017 and 19. Uh, it's the same policy as Windows Server 2022. So th those are some uh, doc updates that we've had recently. Wow. And you know what I really appreciate about the team is your not only just your interest, but your desire to connect with the community. So I know being a member of the team prior and then your experience with the team, there's always this focus on how is that going to land with the community? So I love mm -hmm. the interest and the energy that's there. And speaking about the community and also um, my path similar to yours being a, a contractor, one of the pieces of content that I used the most heavily was T-SQL. In fact, on some of my more trickier situations that I've had to deal with databases, I relied really heavily on that content. You and I talked about it earlier, but I'm wondering if you could share with the community what are what's happening within T-SQL that you can share. Sure. So I'm glad you mentioned that because this really brings those two things together. I wanted to talk about this for some of our largest T-SQL syntax pages. The arguments list is pretty enormous, uh, many pages tall. And it's not always demarcated clearly about what begins each argument section. We realize that. We've gotten that feedback. And there's a lot of detail in there. And it's tricky enough for cited users. It's even more tricky for screen readers to hop around in to understand what argument they're reading about at that time. So we've been testing 
a different way for formatting those documents. And we're really happy with the results so far. And if you want an example of this new format, you can go to the alter index T-SQL page, just easy to search for that. You'll see the arguments list is a lot more friendly to the eye, friendly to screen readers, friendly in general. So if you've got any feedback on that, you can email uh, this team, the SQL Docs team at sqldocs at microsoft.com directly. You can reach out to us at, at SQL Docs on Twitter, or you can pull up, um, uh, you can open up a pull request on GitHub, which is our favorite thing for you to do, uh, to note a page where that improvement is needed. You know, and I see the mention as we're looking at some of those connection points, and thank you for sharing. Um, I'm going to ask you a surprise question, but I know you'll be able to answer it. Um, you spent a lot of time, in fact, I know we partnered a few times talking about yeah. the contributor space. Yeah. Um, tell me about that experience, because I felt like the energy from the people that were attending was just monumentous. Like, talk about um, how that impact was and, and how do you see that changing? Yeah, we we had a great time. I think you and I presented, co-presented that at a, a variety of events around the world. You know, a lot of things going virtual in 2021 also meant that from my home office here, I could present to Europe, Australia, all over the US, all over the world about how to contribute to Microsoft Docs and how it can be beneficial for your career, how you can, uh, you know, get some badges on the wall when it comes to your contributions to the community docs that everyone uses. So we did. We presented to, I think, almost 30 different events, over 500 people and not including like passive recording viewings and things like that, just to make sure that the, the SQL community specifically, but also the, just the Microsoft community in general, because docs on GitHub uh, for all Microsoft products, that's where they're maintained in open source, right? But for the SQL community in general, which is, you know, my community that I was helping run in Baton Rouge, Louisiana for so long, that we were dialed into this way to kind of give back to the community. So yeah, part of our jobs on the SQL Docs team is to interact with the public in terms of the pull requests and the GitHub issues that you send in to us. A lot of these are really helpful. People think, ah, oh, well, I don't really have anything. That's a problem. You know, that's fine. When you find something though, you know, a lot of times those pull requests are really well-intentioned or they're well-researched when they come in. Um, and the customer kind of does a lot of that legwork for us uh, to make sure that these things are corrected, that these things are, are accurate for different versions as they span across different things. So it's really important uh, to us to have that feedback from the community. That's why we're gonna do that. And we're gonna be launching a new kind of tour of the how to give feedback via pull requests in GitHub next year as well, or this year as well. Well, that's so great. And I, I love the community, kind of the crowdsourcing where it feels like everyone can have a share in supporting and uplifting these docs. Um, looks like we're right at time. So, Wim, I want to thank you so much for joining us. It was a pleasure to work with you. I hope that we will have more opportunities in the future. Anna, back great. to Thanks, you. Thanks, Cheryl. Awesome. Thanks, you both, so much. Uh, it's always great to hear how important the community is. And I don't think we could ever stress it enough how important the community, SQL family, uh, all of that is to uh, us at Microsoft and I think just in general being people of the community. Uh, I myself love engaging in the women in tech data platform community. So I'll put a little plug there. But I think, you know, if you want to get involved with us, if you want to uh, start to learn or you think you just want to be a part of this community, uh, it's a very open, welcoming space. Um, so I hope that you'll consider and if you need anything, know there are lots of friendly faces that would love to support you on whatever that journey might entail. Aside from that, uh, we have some more updates to share with you. Uh, those updates are going to be our upcoming events. Uh, and for that, I'm going to bring out our wonderful co-producer, uh, Marisa. Hey, Marisa. Hi, Anna. Thanks for having me on. Of course. What do you so, got? New year, new lineup of events. We actually already did some. We did two or three of them already this year. And I want to talk to you a little bit about what we have going on this quarter. Uh, coming up in February, February 25th, we have the Northern Virginia Data Platform Meetup. And Bob Ward is giving an overview of SQL Server 2022. And this is a free virtual session for you to attend. So anyone can attend from wherever they are. You don't just have to be in the Northern Virginia area. Uh, also coming up, we are participating in the virtual Visual Studio Live Las Vegas Conference. Conference. And this is a 
more developer focused conference, but we decided this year we're going to be involved and kind of do more developer focused sessions. Uh, Bob Ward and David Mari have a hands on lab. It is called Build Serverless Full Stack Applications, including IoT with Azure SQL. So that's a full eight hour session uh, where you can learn more. And then we also have a couple other sessions that we'll be presenting there. So that's happening the end of February into March. And then we also have coming up, which we're planning and we are a premium sponsor. We will have over 50 sessions. We'll have six pre-cons. We'll have the keynote. We'll have a booth. We have so much going on there. We will be in London at SQL Bits 2022 starting on March 8th. Um, as always, you can, in addition, you'll find, um, you know, more of what we have going on with our data exposed episodes and we launch those every Thursday. And that's all I have for today. Awesome. Thanks so much, Marisa. Uh, always exciting to hear uh, what's going on. So thank you. Thanks. And I'm just so excited for SQL Bit. So, you know, fingers crossed we're able to do this thing in person, but I'm so excited. So uh, if you're you're itching to get out there or even I know they have some virtual uh, discounts, uh, definitely check out SQL Bits 2022. That's my shameless plug. Uh, I did want to mention there was a question earlier on uh, that I missed. Uh, there was a question about Azure SQL database failover groups for hyperscale if it is available in GovCloud. Um, and the answer is yes. So I just confirmed with Emily that the answer is yes for that. So hopefully that helps answer your question. Uh, and the final thing is, of course, you know, I have a few things I like to plug at the end of our episodes. One is a Microsoft Learn learning module of the month. So if you follow along with me, you can learn one module a month. And, uh, you know, that's that, that's good progress. It's hard to make time for learning, but uh, the time is it's always worth to make time. So here's my little plug for introduction to Azure Arc enabled data services. This was built recently by Bob Ward and Buck Woody. So who better to learn about Azure Arc enabled data services then Bob Ward and Buck Woody, I'll, I'll, I'll just wait for a better answer. Um, no, I'm just kidding, but totally like very excited about this uh, module. It's really awesome. It's going to walk through, you know, what does hybrid mean? What are the options that we have for SQL managed instance as well as Postgres SQL hyperscale? So you're going to want to check this one out. And the short URL is here, but it's also going to be uh, in the blog. So feel free to check out the blog for all the links uh, from today. Um, the other thing that I wanted to mention is my pick of the month. And I promise I don't mean to do this in vain, but I worked with various teams across the organization to come up with the Azure SQL year in review. And this is something we did live in person uh, uh, in December. And we had a bunch of great people on the show to talk about this. Uh, but if you missed the show, uh, one thing I wanted to mention is that we updated this short URL to aka.ms slash news update 2021. So if you're ever trying to think like, oh, I think this was released in 2021 recently, or, you know, I'm wondering if this became available in 2021, uh, this can be your new one-stop shop to kind of figure that out. What we've done is for, for every product, uh, we put together what landed in public preview and general availability across, and you'll see SQL Server VMs, Azure SQL Managed Instance, Azure SQL Database, updates across Azure SQL, migrations, Azure Arc, and even some of the, the hot links for uh, SQL Server 2022, if you want to learn more about that. Uh, so I really think this can be a great resource for you as you try to remember things that might have been launched recently. Uh, so I hope it is. Uh, you know, let, let us know, leave a comment, let us know what you think of this, if it's helpful, if you like these sorts of like one stop shop for a bunch of updates or not. Um, but yeah, hopefully this is is uh, something that you all consider uh, taking a look at and consider useful. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention, and I know, sorry, I've mentioned it a couple times probably, but uh, again, for those of you that might be newer to the show or just tuning in for the first time this year and you're like, wonder what this news update is all about. So you've now seen all of the updates for Azure SQL covering from basically mid-November to now. Uh, and you're wondering, hey, I want to read more about service endpoint policies for SQL managed instance from Zorin. 
or Azure SQL Database Hyperscale from Emily, or another update that I mentioned that I didn't get to spend a lot of time in or you want more of the details in, the good news is all of it's posted, all the links, everything's curated at aka.ms slash news update. And every month we update this short URL to point to the latest blog. It goes live when we go live. Uh, so hopefully this is a good resource as well. If you take a look uh, at the one for January, you can see it's already been posted and you'll get all those product updates. Again, we're going to start trying. Oh, I'm not sharing my screen. <laughs> Got him. Uh, OK, so <laughs> this is the blog. So you'll get all the product updates. And like I mentioned earlier, we're going to start trying to include some of these other database services updates. Uh, again, let us know if this is something you want to see more of or less of or whatnot. You can mine all the videos. So everything we talked about today, you can get a link to, essentially, as well as some of those events. So Visual Studio Live and how to sign up for the uh, pre-cons, uh, SQL bits, and the, the meetup that's online, as well as our featured learn module, and anything that's related to the pick of the month. So hopefully, uh, this is a good resource uh, for you all. Um, that's the link at the bottom of the screen. So aka.ms slash news update. This might be the first time in data exposed history that we are going to end early. Uh, but I just want to thank you all for joining us on the show today. It's always a pleasure. We'll be back at the, uh, the same time next month. Um, so we hope you'll join us. Uh, again, if you like this video, go ahead, give it a like, leave us a comment, subscribe to our channel, start watching our episodes on Thursdays and Tuesdays. And we hope to see you next time on Data Exposed.